again and welcome to Man's Talk. I am Tammy Simmons Garthwaite. She is. I am. And I am Carla Garrick. I, I see people still struggling with that. You with know? my name? No, with, with my your name. name. <laughs> yeah, Garrick. I don't know why it's so... I, I mean, I think it's just because of the E at the end. I know, you know, but if it was French, you wouldn't say the E? I, you know, I don't know. I don't, um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. People, I, I don't know. I got Garth Waite. Good luck with that. That is long, and that I is very like, long for a political yeah, sign. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Man, I am so excited because uh, the city of Manchester has given me so much motivation to go knock doors to yeah. win my race in Ward 11. Uh, so I can't wait to go door yeah, to I'm door, okay. I'm actually especially around the West yeah. Manchester community center that yeah. is being planned uh, down there. Yep. So I've been filing right to know requests and been getting some interesting information. We have a website that will be going up that is pretty much safe. Uh, I forget the exact name, uh, I, but basically the gist is save Parkside or keep Parkside Parkside. Something like um, that. <laughs> you know, and, and again, and I, I, I'll cover this in the Carla Garrick show tomorrow. I'm gonna go do a little tour and stuff because I'm not sure people fully understand exactly like the, 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 this location that's right. been selected is at the end of five dead end streets. Yeah, it, well, it's, 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 it's like, you know, it's, it's, I was down there the other day that the speed limit on the alleyway, which is the only thing that goes into that street mm -hmm. is 10 miles right. an hour. This is not like, oh, let's like put something right. in. This isn't on South Main Street or Second Street or Kelly, even Kelly Street, which is just a, you know, Congested mess. Anyways, it, this is uh, literally in a neighborhood. And just to fill people in, if they aren't reading or keeping up with it, um, when we talked last week, we tape on Tuesdays. So there was the aldermanic meeting um, last Tuesday evening. Um, all the news articles, it irks me because I'm not, I feel like we all know that the news, just news in general, isn't what it used to be. And I, I'm always interested, I always find it intriguing when I was at something and then I read the account of what happened and they make it sound like in the Union Leader article today, they make it sound like, well, it was a mixed bag. bag. There were people mm -hmm. in support and people against. Let me give you the reality. So this is today's paper and the headline is West Manchester Community Center clears first hurdle. And the first hurdle was the alderman saying, yes, we'd like to sell you this property for $600,000, despite the fact that there was an hour's worth of public input, right? The three minute, everybody gets three minutes. 14 people, 14 individuals spoke against doing this, at least in the sense of either completely against or slowing it down or getting more information, et cetera. 14 actual individuals. Eight people spoke in favor, but every single one of them was either from the Stebbins group or was an elected school official or you know somehow connected with the project not one individual got up there from the any neighborhood part of the, or, or any part like of the from city the west and, side said, and said this sounds like said, an I awesome think this idea. is a great idea and there were plenty of people I mean I know because like I spoke Dan didn't speak Dan's opposed to it um I saw oh like half the people the room was standing well, I, room right. only and, I, and, and a I lot knew, of people didn't speak right I knew a lot of people you know that maybe you know, one of the two people in a, you know, a couple spoke or whatnot. And there were people who just weren't comfortable. There's a lot of people who just aren't comfortable speaking on camera and I really don't bl blame them. So it was kind of, it was very disappointing to read that despite all this pushback from the actual community, from the actual people impacted by this property sale, that the alderman, every single alderman except uh, the Ward 12 alderman um, didn't vote because she said she had a conflict of in interest. Which, which, by the way, I want to find out what it is yeah. because one of the other properties that they were looking at, which would be way more ideally suited because it is very close to the people I believe that they're, they're trying to serve, mm -hmm. is in Ward 12. So I f and, and that was a housing authority yeah, the house, land. Yeah, but housing authority said, said they didn't want to sell no, their land. No, we're just not going to sell. It. Right. So um, I have questions about that part, mm. which we will be investigating mm. on so, behalf of the so West Manchester she, residents. She, um, the, the Ward 12 alderman abstained from voting, and the only other alderman of the, the 13 remaining that voted no was uh, Ward 8 
Ed Sapienza, I'm going to say it again. Thank you, Ed, for voting with the what the people wanted. And he, he even talk, told me, you know, I've seen him since then, and he said he's not against it. And, you know, I'm not 100% against it either. I, I'm not against a boys and girls club presence in West Manchester. And, you know, somebody could make the case that something could be build on, built on that parcel of land that involved just the boys and girls club. There's all sorts of what ifs that I could be convinced, okay, yeah, I can get behind that. But this, this isn't it. This is not, this has not been the right process for the neighbors. It, I mean, I feel so, bad for anybody who lives near city owned land who thought, well, geez, I live on the back of Dairyfield Park, you know, my, whatever, I'm just picking that. Cause maybe tomorrow they'll sell that corner of Dairyfield Park to, you know, some health agency and they'll put a, a clinic in your backyard. So, so, you know, I think we can actually analyze this just from a what's wrong with government perspective. So while it's being colored as this sort of community thing, I'll start with, uh, I went down to the community garden that is mm. currently there last Wednesday, I believe it was the day after the vote. And I just happened to, because I wanted to scope it out a little more and be like, do people actually understand like where this is? And sort of, yep. because it's a really bad location, right. in my opinion, for something like this. Um, and I ran into a couple of gardeners who, by the way, were coming from the east side to mm. use the West Side Community Garden Resource, which puts to mind the issue where several of the right to know letters we received, where they are making the case mm -hmm. for um, this is surplus land that is in the public good. Right. No one defines what are the criteria to decide what the public good is, and no one gave any data on what they based Oh, it on I mean, for the public good. If you read today's, uh, the article in the Union Leader today, it, it goes on to clearly say they have not completed the needs assessment, that they, um, despite the fact that we continually were told this is, you know, Amoskeg Health and Boys and Girls Club, even today's Union Leader article with the, it is also apparent that there are going to be many other nonprofits housed in this and, space. And, and, you know, and anyway, so I ran into this lady who was, picking basil. And I asked her, hey, did you hear about this thing where they're going to rip out our community garden, maybe move it, but I don't know about the trust circle here based right. on the way right. <laughs> everything was approached from the start. I don't know why I would believe you if you tell me you're going to do that because you started this off in an extremely unethical way, uh, which we all know because you were also at that school meeting, the first one where they let the abutters know. So anyway, this lady who was picking her basil, did not know about the changes that were being proposed. Mm. She was very upset about the notion that the community garden would be ripped out, whether it's replaced, moved, or whatever. Basically, the community built Didn't, a community right. garden that other people are now saying doesn't suit the community. I asked her, well, I mean, did you see a notice? So if, if these groups, all statists, Everyone's paid by the state in this. Uh, did they put up a sign on the community garden to notify the community about this? No. Nope. Like, 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 was there a poster up? I know they say that you worked with some nonprofits in the neighborhood to uh, put out the survey, but did you put a sign on the community garden saying, no. hey, we're thinking about doing these things to your community garden? You didn't which means you did not want the people in the neighborhood to know what you were up to until you unethically, in a back room deal, because it was a sealed non-public meeting, to sell the land without giving us the criteria for the sale, without telling us what the actual uh, public good is, I personally would like to analyze the data to make sure that we're all on the same page about it. Because based on my research, property values drop when you put these things in. So not on top of sacrificing in the neighborhood where the neighbors were all like, you know, the traffic's actually kind of sucky already just with the schools here. And, you know, they were like, oh, everything's going to get worse. So you are asking this group of people 
to sacrifice mm -hmm. for the greater good. The greater good. Whatever that means, because I posit, if the greater good isn't good for me, it's not the greater good. Because who are you to decide what the greater good is for me? You mm. can't. It's nonsensical. So I'm mad, as yeah. we all know. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think they've gone about this the right way. I don't think so either. And that's, um, I think, what bothers me the most. It's not so, I mean, I'm bothered by the fact that the community garden is going to get moved. I'm bothered by the fact that there's going to be less green space. But I'm really most disturbed by the fact that this was just like steamrolled through. It was apparent when we were at the Aldermanic meeting that they, are, it was a done deal. There, it, you know, you can you can say you're taking input from the people that, and all the articles say, oh, there's plenty of opportunities for the neighbors to be involved. But you didn't inform the abutters until after you had signed the letter of sale. And Joe Kelly Levasseur, who is for the project, who voted for it last Tuesday night, did say, I'm not willing to to vote at the subcommittee yeah. hearing because he was honorable enough to say, you know what, you guys are doing the neighbors dirty and I won't vote for this until you inform the abutters. After that vote was a week after that is when they informed the abutters mm -hmm. and had that meeting where we all got shut yeah. down. Okay, so back to my original point. How would we like government to behave? Let's take away the parties. Let's take away who's the mayor. Let's take away all the vested interests and all the money coming in, the federal grants, these lies, this stuff here. How would we like this to have proceeded? Well, I would say the polite thing to do is to talk to the people who live there first, right? Not to pretend we're going to put out surveys and whatever, to actually talk to the people who are there. So before the sale was signed, people should have informed the abutters. And then we should have had an opportunity to do it. Why do I know I'm right? Because Joe Kelly took that vote. Secondly, after we said, well, we should inform the abutters, the other thing we should have done is we should say, well, we should put it out to an RFP. There are many purposes for this park. Maybe the community garden people want to, I don't know, form a co-op, right. raise the money, Have and also buy market. the land, you know, put things. in a shed, and do a farmer's market. Who knows, right? But here's the thing. We won't know because the process was not followed. So Ed Sapienza, last Tuesday, voted for and his reason voted against it and his reason was the right way to have approached this would have been one as joe kelly said inform the abutters then two put out an rfp so that we can do this fairly so we already know based on those two votes that that would have been the correct procedure so i can prove and i have proved to you that at a minimum the decent thing that you would expect a community center to do is those steps so you know on top of the apology i think we got to go back to the drawing board and we got to look at that stuff on top of it 40 percent of that land mm -hmm. is not buildable it's right. a it's really hill. steep hill that comes down. So we're talking about two acres now right. where they want to put up 40,000 square foot building. Um, now, of course, they put the number there because then when we go to zoning, they will concessions, concessions will cut the size of the well, building, the building the, In fairness, the building footprint is only 20,000 square feet. I'm not saying it's small, but it's 20,000 20, because there'll be two floors of 20,000. Okay. But it's still, this is not a big parcel of land. No. By the time you take a 20,000 square foot building. And rip and out the, parking, half the community garden. Well, I mean, and put in the parking that you'll have to have for this, this center. And then relocate. There's not going to be any green space left. There's just not going to be. So um, not, sig not not big enough to do anything. I mean, if they're calling, you know, median grass plant, like little medians, if they're considering that green space, then maybe there'll be some green space. But there's not going to be any gr big green lawn left. You know, there and we should be. mention one of the people who actually came with these remarks last week, and he was very nervous, mm -hmm. was a veteran mm -hmm. who has PTSD. Mm -hmm. Thank you, government. And he bought his house 
at the end of that cul-de-sac because he needs green space well, around and he him needs a quiet, and he right. needs a quiet kind of thing and stuff. So this guy who was not consulted or told or anything at any stage is now going to increase his property taxes, decrease his quality of living yep. um, because no one bothered to ask the community what they want. So we got railroaded and steamrolled and you guys picked the wrong place. Um, so that's that. That's not going away anytime soon. Um, I did want to talk a little bit. Interesting. I, I guess it's all, you know, to me, it's all very similar in, in um, the underlying theme of whether the government is responsive to people. You know, you've got government and you've got all the people and people are busy and living and doing their thing and they forget to really pay too much attention to government in general and that's how we end up with things i mean i'm not saying we weren't paying attention but i'm just saying that's how things can get away from the people because nobody's really paying attention right so i saw an article which i'm very interested in um it was shared by manchester inklink and it is written by it says it's a five, special five-part series so this will be interesting um, produced by the Concord Monitor of the Granite State News Collaborative. Um, and this one is titled Growing Ranks. The number of New Hampshire police officers has grown twice as fast as the population over the past 20 years. So I perused through it because I thought, well, that's interesting. And that's... We, I, mean, I, I believe New Hampshire has the highest per capita concentration growth. of police officers um, to well, it, it, citizens? It, 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 that very well may be. And I just thought it was interesting because keep in mind that this is the Concord Monitor. The Concord Monitor is hardly a conservative newspaper. Um, so in here, they have a whole list of all the towns and how much they've increased. And um, a couple different things. One, um, Concord isn't alone. It, obviously, they started with Concord because it's Concord sure. Monitor. Concord isn't alone in its ever-growing police department. Despite falling crime rates, the total number of police officers in New Hampshire has continued to mushroom over the past two decades. Over the last 20 years, the number of full-time certified police officers in the state has increased by 20%. From uh, It doesn't matter about those actual numbers. Blah, blah, blah according to New Hampshire Police Standards and Training Council. So this isn't a number being made up by somebody else. New Hampshire's population increased by 11% during that same time period. Um, so across the state, now keep in mind, that's a lot of places, those little sleepy towns and whatnot. So if you go to Man in here, um, interesting, one of the men involved in this um, data, in a typical, this caught my eye, and this made me go, oh. In a typical community, the police are going to be the most expensive line on their budget, which in Manchester we know is not true. The schools are the most expensive line on a budget, but then it would probably be the police. Um, said James McCabe, an associate professor at Sacred Heart University and a retired New York Police Department mm -hmm. official who consults with police departments on staffing. His quote, if left to themselves, police chiefs will just ask for more. Um, oh, and they do. And since, you know, no one's paying any of the bills and we're just well, making funny money, it's really so easy just to get grants and just to pay for things. When they talk about, um, in here, they talk about New Hampshire's biggest cities, so that would be Manchester, Concord, and Nashua. It says, Manchester Police Department added 61 police officers between 2002 and 2022, bringing the number of officers, because people ask me this all the time, bringing the number of officers to 265 in Okay, 20 so... To give you an idea, the number I have in my head from five years ago when I was working this really well was 230. Yep. So that'll give you the um, extra 30 right there. Bringing us to 265 in 2022, which was an increase of 30%. Um, and, you know, right away, there's going to be people on the left who are going to be like, you're anti-cop, you hate police, you hate everything. No, I'm no. just putting out the data that has been uh, I don't even acquired. think that's the left. So, that would be the right. <laughs> um, Manchester Chief Ald Alan Aldenberg said that a growing population and more calls for service are driving staffing increases. Growing population. We've increased in 20 years, we've increased our police force 30% city's population during that time only increased 7%. So that means it isn't a growing population that is causing us to need more police. Um, now he did, um, in 2000, the man, this kind of, this was disturbing because we saw the same thing happen with schools. In 2000, Manchester budgeted 11.9 million for its police budget. In 2020, 
that figure had gone up to 25 million, an increase of 112%. So in just 20 years, we've more than doubled our police budget. Where crime, you know, well, that uh, one we always well, do with, you know the, what, with the costs go up for school and, and the what, results but go you down. You know, they say that crime is down and it certain, maybe reported crime is down, maybe maybe on some data plug there the crime shows that it's going down. But I can't tell you how many times a week I read on Facebook about somebody having a problem and needing the police to come and the police can't come because they're over they're understaffed. Oh, but they could they could pay for two of them to be at this community well, meeting standing at the door or with their hands on their guns. I don't um, know what that so, cost us. So it, it it's bothersome because it I mean I'm glad that the Conquer Monitor put this article up because this is an interesting thing. Like how did it how did Manchester need 30% increase in police if we've only increased our seven percent? But it, part of it's they make these cases you know, individual, because they're playing, you know, because emotions. And they say, oh, my God, look at we've got the homeless problem. We need more police to do it. But the, but the homeless problem doesn't go away. And I'll tell you that people who think that this is just something that impacts uh, the parks and whatnot, my employer in the past week has spent, th had to spend thousands of dollars of money that, you know, we're a small business. That's a big deal for a small business to have to spend thousands of dollars that's not in your budget because there was somebody camping out behind our building. And we noticed it last week that mm. like, wait, there's someone coughing. Are they in our building? You know, and they weren't. Wow. There's a tarp and we had to hire a private company with hazardous weight because you couldn't yeah. just go and cut it down because you have no idea. Is there human waste? Is there needles? And if I can't even imagine how many businesses are having to pay to clean up these homeless encampments on private property because we're just allowing this problem to continue. All right, and I want to make this point, and I actually did make it at the Alderman meeting, and I'm not sure if people fully understand this, but here's the reality of economics. Whether the good intentions are there or not, we actually have to judge things by the outcomes. Hmm. So we can all have the best of intentions, but at some stage you have to go, well, are my best intentions actually helping with things? Mm -hmm. So the laws of economics are immutable. That means they're undeniable. It's like gravity. So unless we're going to have to debate about whether gravity is relative, let's just assume for a moment the world is round yeah. and gravity exists, OK? So the law of economics says if you subsidize something, think about corn and sugar, mm -hmm. which is now in everything and causing a self-inflicted chronic metabolic disease across this nation. So. Sugar and corn were subsidized. So if you subsidize something, you get more of it. So by way of example, if you declare a war on drugs or a war on poverty and you start throwing money at it, you get more drug use and more poverty. Now, why is that? That is because you have now misaligned the incentives. You have actually now created a department that gets their money from more poverty. So let's take it full circle back to the community center. Both these realities could be true. I'm going to say we're going to put that in and crime is going to go up and poverty is going to go up. And I can give you the reasons why, but we're going to run out of time. The same people who from the Boys and Girls Club and all these nonprofits that get millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars from the federal government and from the state government have an incentive to create more poverty. So we're going to put in the center and then we're going to start to measure certain things. We're not going to put in the center there, by the way. Um, so then we're going to measure things. And then within their milieu, within the world they have created, they're like, see, we're so special because we're fighting poverty and there's just more poverty for us to fight. And I'm like, but you're looking for the poverty right. and you're extending the poverty. There has never been one of these centers that have been put in where anything has gotten like better in terms of the actual geographic area around that. And I can prove that with the police who do precog 
crime now. Yes. Right? Because I am going to get every single spot where you guys go do extra policing. And I'm pretty sure it's going to correlate to prove my point. Do you want to mention a couple things going on this week before we get, <laughs> get the shut off notice? Um, Tomorrow night, Wednesday, so today's the 26th, so Wednesday the 27th at 6 p.m., there is a walk through um, Piscataqua River Park, I believe with um, Parks and Rec, because um, a woman, I, Carol, I can't think of your last name, um, lives up on um, Tondro Court at the top of the hill, and she would like to see Precourt River Park, the Piscataqua River Par Park off of Precourt Street be... Um, cleaned up and more maintained and made into the beautiful park that it potentially could be. So they're meeting at uh, the George Smith soccer fields at 6 p.m. Wednesday, the 27th. If you live in that area and are interested in seeing what's, gonna, oh, what's really going on. Oh, it's really lovely down um, there. You come on out and do that. We're lucky um, to have that on the On side. Thursday, the 28th, also this week, um, we're doing a free book giveaway, a uh, summer literacy drive. We'll be giving away children's books um, for a wide range of ages. Uh, myself, Dan Garthwaite, uh, Victoria Sullivan, um, will be at Sweeney Park from 5 to 6 p.m. Apparently that's when, um, I called it the feeding and that's not really nice. Um, that's when we're giving away also free food because apparently we feed all the children all summer long with I don't know, taxpayer money, food, because I don't know, I guess parents don't feed their kids. Um, but anyways, we did it in, co in conjunction with that. So it'd be at the same time, there'll be kids at Sweeney Park, um, which is right there on South Main Street, 5 to 6 p.m. this coming Thursday. If you've got kids and you want you want to get some free books, come on over there. Everything's free. There's no no catches, no, you know, no, you don't have to listen to a pitch. We're just trying to get books in the hands of kids so that our children become more literate. Um, and if folks are interested to learn more or stay up to date on the community park stuff, there is a Facebook group that I started. Uh, you can find out more at, I believe it's Save Park Side Park is what it's called. Um, I still need to learn all the names and, uh, you know, but um, that's just a way to stay up to date. Again, the issue is let's do it right and let's figure out if this is the right place. Uh, but the way this has been handled is not the way you treat your neighbors if you are a decent human being. Uh, weather seems to have broke a little, uh, much nicer out there today than it has been. Um, still gonna be in the 90s, so, you know, get out there and enjoy things. Maybe check out the public pools, but be aware that Dan and I tried to do that the other day and they they're not closed. open. It wasn't open they just, when they said yeah, it would be yeah, open because there was yeah. a thunderstorm earlier that day, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I'll try again another day. Um, but get, oh. stay cool. Go to the, go, you know, walk your dog, take a walk in one of the parks. Um, stay cool. And I say goodbye from some. cranky Carla. <laughs> and we'll be back. Carla will be not back next week. I won't I be here. Uh, maybe we could get Janine or someone from the community center be to fun. be my guest. That would be good. Anyways, that's all we got. All right. Bye, bye. guys.